hope that you'll see tonight that we really are making a concerted effort to grow our programs and it does take a very long time but we're getting there. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and talk just a little bit about um, the essential components of reading instruction. And a lot of how I refer to this is it's the building blocks. So you look at these components here and you look at how they build upon one another. Just, and you'll hear them a lot of times referred to as the five essential building blocks. And a lot of times when we look at talking about what students need, we look at all these different components. So the first one, um, you really need to look at, you know, the essential pieces the explicit and systematic instruction that you're looking at for reading. Um, so the first piece you look at is phonemic awareness, and that's really looking at that smallest unit of sound, which is a phoneme. A lot of the tasks that we look at for this are identifying those pieces that you do orally. When you look at what the initial sound is, the final sound, and the medial sound, and then you look at how you kind of manipulate and blend and segment all those pieces. Um, the next one you really look at is the phonics piece, and this is where you really look at those sounds that you have for the spoken language, and you look at how those sounds are represented in written language with your spelling. Um, the next component you look at is vocabulary development, and how I like to really look at vocabulary development in reading, it isn't just in reading per se, it's across all curriculum areas. So you want to look at how you're developing your vocabulary in math, you want to look at science, you want to look at social studies, you want to look at your related arts, because that's something that goes into a big component of all the reading. And then when you look at it, you really want to look at the fluency piece, and you want to look at how that is developed. It's basically just reading quick, quickly and accurately with a little bit of expression. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. I mean, we can dig deep into each one of those, but that are, those are the components that we look at for those pieces. And then finally, not to be underscored, um, Hopefully, A through D have developed well enough to accomplish E, which is our goal of reading comprehension. Um, and you have to have the strong foundation in order to be successful with that. Um, so um, the importance of E, as I like to say. <laughs> Sorry, do you have the next slide? Okay. Can you go ahead? Yeah. Okay. Basically kind of what we just summed up to is really looking at reading, but here's reading kind of broken down anymore. Um, you're looking at really is that complex system where you're looking at getting your meaning from print. And in order to do that, you need to look at all the following components. Um, so you need, as I just mentioned, you need to look at the skills and knowledge to understand how those phonemes or the speech sounds, how are those sounds connected to the print that we all read? The next piece is how do you look at having the ability you need to decode unfamiliar words? How do you use those strategies and those sounds and how do you work together? That's why a lot of times we look at um, some of the reading programs we do. You teach the skills with the real words, but you also test nonsense words to see how students are really looking at. Can they use those skills and generalize or apply them to the nonsense words? As I mentioned before, um, on C we're looking at reading fluently. And then you need to look at how you have that sufficient background knowledge. We're really building on that background information and vocabulary so you can foster your reading comprehension. Good yeah. Thanks. yeah, I think this is um, a bit repetitive from the previous slide, but really what is reading all of these things going together and working together um, so that students can access information? And so when we put this presentation out there for you, if you want to, I'm just going back a slide, if you want to actually see the Stanislaw Dehane um, video, you can just click right there. It's about 35 minutes, but it's a really nice video that will talk to you about how all of those components work within the brain, how we have to um, take those phonemes, correlate them to letters, then have that sound make some kind of sense, then have those sound pieces come together to make a word, then have that word have meaning, have that word have meaning relative to all of the other words that are there. And so it's a really complex system, but he does a very nice job of sort of explaining that. He's, I think, a cognitive neurologist, a neuroscientist, that's what it is. All right, so one of the things that we are doing in the district, and I think that we've always done this, but maybe not with the 
really specific lens that we're trying to, to reach. Uh, when we look at what do we mean by scientifically based reading research, right? This is, is sort of a two-parter here. If we think about A, um, applies rigorous, systematic, and objective procedures to obtain valid knowledge relevant to reading development, reading instruction, and reading difficulties. That's some of the stuff that we are doing as educators. So we're sort of looking around and we're saying, well, what kinds of things do we need? What do we know about reading instruction? What do we know um, about when a kid is struggling to read? What kinds of interventions are available to us? Should we try that? Is it working? Is it not working? How much longer should we try it before we abandon this and, and try something else? And I know that while I'm saying that, you're probably hearing a clock tick, 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 because you can hear that clock, the time going by, where your children are not making the kind of progress you might want to see them make. But, and you'll see this too in one of our later slides, I very often liken this to, you know, if you go see your medical doctor and you complain that you have, you know, an ache or a pain, he or she may say to you, well, this is an intervention, let's see if that works. Sometimes the ache or the pain goes away, sometimes we have to try another intervention. Sometimes we have to try multiple interventions. Um, we are also thinking about research in different ways. So if we look at B, Sometimes we have just that sort of systemic um, and empirical kind of thing, right? So we watch and we watch and we see how that kid is doing. And that's not necessarily something that we've read in a peer-reviewed journal. And it's not, not something that, you know, a cognitive neurologist has said to us. But what we do is we observe and we experiment and we, and we see if it's working. And we have different kinds of um, assessment data to tell us whether or not it is or isn't working. Uh, that gets us to number two, where we talk about rigorous data, data analysis. So what we try to do is we get all of those pieces together. And if we look at number three, where we talk about different kinds of measurements, multiple measurements, multiple observations, multiple observers. We, and I've said this at many different presentations, we actually do have data sheets so that we can see where children are scoring on things like the QRI, the star reading data, on um, BAS data, um, MCAS data, all of that data is out there for us. We, you know, even access data for our English language learners. There are tons and tons of data points that we kind of put together. Um, and then the last one is just peer-reviewed journals. And so I think that our teachers in our district, learning specialists, reading specialists, regular classroom teachers, do an awful lot of reading about you know, reading and language acquisition and, and those kinds of things. Before tonight, Connie Shagnon, who is now our out of district placement coordinator, had sent to Karen and me a huge stack of printed peer-reviewed journal articles and said, here they are for what they're worth. You know, you may want to read them, you may want to share them, but those are the kinds of things that I know our specialists are doing. So what programs do we currently have in place? Um, and just in, in recent conversations, I've had lots of talk with people about using guided reading. And when Janine was talking a minute ago, she said sort of that really explicit instruction around phonemic awareness. So uh, people who are not big fans of guided reading will say, well, you know, is there enough explicit instruction? And to make sure that we have that explicit instruction, we have married that to foundations. So our kids are getting phonemic awareness and phonics in that K1 and 2 grade level, and then we couple it with the guided reading. Um, one of the things that we hear all the time is that in a district where kids are going to be practicing reading a lot, practicing reading in class, there's a lot of time devoted to it, practicing reading at home, practicing reading in other disciplines like science and social studies, they will do very well with foundations and guided reading. For our kids who are uh, not on IEPs, we use the LLI. For some kids who are on IEPs, we use the LLI, and certainly you can talk more to that than I can because you are very close to the classroom instruction. Um, but some of the other programs that we have, we do have Wilson is needed, and we use um, Edmark and Reading Milestones. These little pieces right here will tell you that things like uh, Wilson Reading System, like foundations, those things are very effective and they've been proven effective in building uh, phonemic awareness and helping children learn how to read. Uh, but one of the things that we think is really important is that it may not necessarily be programs per se that teach children how to read. 
right? We have to have instructors who are able to use those programs to teach our children how to read. And so this, I think, has been our sort of big ticket item with the CPAC people. How are we taking our teachers and getting them prepared to teach struggling readers and to use programs differently? I'm going to be very honest with you. When um, we started having these conversations, your group and uh, me as the assistant superintendent who would be building these programs, a little bit of investigation let us realize, and we just have sort of chosen these, that we, in terms of Wilson Certified Learning Specialists, I don't want you to think we don't have lots of Wilson Certified people in the district. We do. But they are not necessarily anymore in those kinds of positions where they are like teaching kids. Sometimes we can, you know, sort of pull them and they can uh, work for an hour a day with a particular child, you know. But right now we really have just one learning specialist who is Wilson certified. Uh, when we talk about Orton Gillingham, we have no one who is Orton Gillingham certified in our district currently. Uh, and if we look at something like Linda Mood Bell, if we look at uh, LIPS and V&V, we have two people who are there right now. Because of the dialogue that we've started with CPAC, and I have said to people, you have to just have faith. You have to trust that we are doing our best to get people where they need to be. And it's not like you can just train somebody in five minutes because it's you know typically a five-day training, and then there's a long practicum, and then these people actually get a certification that goes along with it. So hopefully by this time next year and I will tell you that we have two people who have already started the Orton Gillingham training uh, they are probably about oh I don't know maybe halfway through the process right now but there will be a practicum that they have to do um, and we have folks uh, who are attending uh, Linda Mood Bell, LIPS and v, v as well so we should be in a much better place next year I will let Janine talk about Wilson certification okay I'll just add a little bit I need those of you who know me out here know I'm the one that's the Wilson certified right there. I'm the Wilson guru right now in the, especially in the K through five. Um, there are people like Dr. Kavanaugh just mentioned that do have some certification. Their roles do not lend them right now. There's some of them are doing it a little bit right now. Um, but some of them, it, the positions they're in, it doesn't lend to that. But I would say Wilson is really for, there's, there's a small group of students that it really works for. Some years there's more, some years there isn't. It just really depends. But there's an assessment that we use, and it really is for when you look at those assessments, what you're doing. I mean, this is a lot of detail, but it's that 0 to 15 percent that they score on that when you're looking at their decoding and their uncoding for that. So, um, because then that goes off into, which is not on tier, that into just words, and it goes into a lot more of that. So, but I would say the Wilson is really for just a, a very few and it's been very effective. It's, I mean, I've been doing it for quite a while and it, it really works for those kids. And like Dr. Kavanaugh said, we're really, we look at data. We have, I have all kinds of spreadsheets and data that talk about where the progress is for that. So, and just, I think to go, to yeah, thing, to go back to that <laughs> the like other one. <laughs> the pending in parentheses, there is, the, the district is very invested in pursuing additional certified Wilson trainers or teachers however right now Wilson is doing its own internal rehab or you know up, update um, so they are kind of have put a stall on any uh, training going forward but once that's rolled out a next set of um, professional development opportunities we will do we will be doing that we definitely have interested staff and um, see the value in that so that um, program as well right just to add to that uh, they're holding a big workshop this summer <laughs> No, I'm not the Wilson. I'm adding an advertise for that. <laughs> no, but there's a big workshop that they're this summer down at the seaport and they're looking at rolling out. That's why the trainings have been put on hold for Wilson right now because they're rolling out their fourth edition. So we're looking forward to seeing because there's, there's other components in Wilson too, like fluency that we really can get into about too. So that's a good thing and we're looking at because it's, it's a practicum too. So it's going through the overview and then going through a practicum. So those are all the things that like Dr. Kavanaugh said to trust us. We're working on this and we're building building our repertoire of staff that have these skills. Awesome. Yeah, I think this is me. <laughs> so assessing reading. Um, so we assess in accordance with IDEA um, and what students need. Um, so a, a diagnostic reading assessment, what does that mean? Um, the term diagnostic reading assessment means an assessment that is uh, valid, reliable, based on scientifically based reading research. Okay, so then we look at number two, 
Um, we really want to identify a student's strengths and weaknesses um, with the goal of being able to read by the end of grade three. We also want to dis, um, determine what difficulties a child may be having learning to read and the potential cause. Um, so we, going back to those five components of reading, we really want to be targeted and specific in identifying where the breakdown is. Is it in phonics? Is it in fluency? Um, is it in comprehension? Is it in all of the above? But um, more often than not, it's in a, a small part of that. The, the problem doesn't always lie in all of reading. Um, and then thirdly, um, helping to determine possible reading interventions. Um, so we want our assessment to identify strengths, weaknesses, and then help us be a roadmap to figure out how do we treat this. Um, so at the bottom there, we're using as our general ed um, reading assessment for all students, the STAR reading assessment. It's grades one through nine. Okay. And then additionally, we look at more classroom-based intervention or assessments. So um, what does that look like? Um, we want to evaluate a child's learning based on systematic observations by teachers and also um, use that data to improve our instruction. Um, so what does that look like K to five uh, at the K to three level or K to five it's the BAS. We're using the QRI at the upper levels in fourth and fifth grade. And also it's not listed here but a huge component of K to two is foundations and that lends itself to additional data points that we can examine when looking at a student's um, reading needs. All right, so you know, we asked the question, uh, what works for students with disabilities? And you should be very much concerned with your children and their reading growth, absolutely, and we understand that. So when you come to us and you say, I'm very concerned because my child is two years below grade level or my child is you know, 18 months below grade level, then, then we can sit there and have those kinds of conversations that talk about what the testing data are showing us, right? What does that tell us about your child with fluency or with decoding or with comprehension or a couple of those things? Uh, but one of the things that I think it's so important for us to remember is that if we were living in the medical world, there would be some kind of therapy that would, you know, that would be the therapy, the treatment, the intervention to help resolve that issue. And we are really trying to grow those programs so that in the educational world, we're able to do that. Uh, when we talk about uh, what, what works and what doesn't work, if you are looking for a resource, there is something called uh, the What Works Clearinghouse, and you can click on that link right there, and it will take you there. And it will talk about the efficacy of Linda Mood Bell or of foundations, um, some of those things. But you also need to know that if you look there and you don't see something like, I don't know, Fountas and Pinnell Leveled Literacy Intervention, right? If you don't see that there. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's a bad program. It just might mean that no one has ever done the research to put into the What Works Clearinghouse. You could go there and see something and see that, you know, its efficacy is very low. Um, but at the same time, what we have found is that, you know, there's no right one right answer, but we have found that LLI will work great for some kids. Foundation, some kids need a double dose. You know, so we continue to build those things. Some of the other things that we might want to think about are, you know, are there other kinds of assessments that we're not currently using? So after we finish with the QRI or with um, BAS data or with a STAR, would there be some other assessment that might be something that helps us um, inform that sort of intervention for a kid? And, you know, we typically do these as a part of what we do for all children, but there may need to be an additional assessment for, you know, a student who doesn't seem to be making that kind of reading progress that we hope for. All right, and then we look at kind of our last slide here is what we can offer um, for the kiddos of Hopkinton here. And this is something that we've talked about this evening is that ongoing communication is so important. Um, and what we've talked about throughout the slides is really just the fattening of the program and resources and continuing to grow and be open and have those discussions like what other training do we need and just in collaboration. Looking at the interventions, you know, all those effective things that are the interventions that are working. And there's times where you have to try something and then you realize that 
we need to look at something else. But that's, you know, a response to intervention and just, you know, looking at what works there. Having that ongoing assessment and to make sure that those interventions are working. Um, looking at differentiating, differentiating the instructions, and that's what we need to do for all our learners. And then something I think that we're passionate, and all of us in this room and this community all believe in, is the belief that all children can learn. And that's, that's really the, the best message, I think, through this slide tonight, is all these kids can learn. And just some just learn differently than others, and that's what we all are here to do, to support one another and help the kids. So. Yeah, and I think that that kind of came through before when Lauren was saying, you know, there have been those kinds of relationships that we certainly want to mend. I can tell you that every time a teacher or a principal or a learning specialist or a reading specialist or anyone comes to work in the morning, we really do hope for the best things for your children. And so when, you know, even when it seems like things have become acrimonious or whatever, Please know that we want to work with, with you and your students to ensure that, that your kids are getting that kind of literacy instruction. And we thank you for your patience with us as we kind of grow these programs and, and see where we can take them. But our goal is to make sure that children get literacy because I don't think there's any greater gift. Honestly.